This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of Stanley Kubrick's immortal cult classic, A Clockwork Orange. I will be talking to Carol Drinkwater. Don't you just love that name? She played the young nurse in the movie. And um, she's had a long career of acting, mostly in a lot of um, stuff um, in England and over Europe. And um, she has written a lot of books. Um, She turned to writing uh, a little bit later in life. Uh, She has a book out called um, An Act of Love. And uh, we're going to talk about that as well. It's a novel. And um, she was also in a a movie I didn't even know existed called Queen Kong in 1976. And um, she was in the uh, 1978 Jersey School of Mosque uh, horror film The Shout. Um, she got fame in uh, Europe for a series called All Creatures, Great and Small, and I'm going to ask her about that stuff as well. Well, the weekend is approaching, and I'm going to be 38 on Sunday. I'm starting to feel like um, Roger Hodgson in Super Tramp's Logical Song. You know, I'm starting to think, you know, what have I learned? And can someone tell me who I am? I mean, I've been in this middle-aged funk for about two years now, but I just got to figure out a way to snap out of it. It's just, it's a tough thing that everybody goes through. But I will. As you all know, I'm a survivor. So yeah, here is my interview with Carol Drinkwater. Hey, Carol. Hi, Tommy. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. We've just got back from three lovely days in Marseille. Oh, was it beautiful down there? Yeah, really lovely. Really, really lovely. And the sun was shining. It was beautiful. Very nice little trip. Oh, I'm so glad. Glad that you had a uh, good time in this crazy time that we're in. <laughs> this it's is a... still, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Okay, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so, going back in time, uh, your father, Peter Regan, uh, was a band leader and an agent. Uh, your sister is Linda Regan, an, an actress and a novelist. Uh, I'm sure you gravitated toward acting early on in your childhood. Uh, yeah, I wanted to be an actress from about the age of four or five. Um, I used to do kind of um, dance shows in front of my parents and grandparents. My grand- grandparents were in the music hall, and my uncle was a musician as well. So it's been very much in my father's side of the family for several generations, and it just seemed like the natural thing to do that I would... Uh, I mean, uh, they were much more into light entertainment, and I, I kind of got spooky and said, oh, I want to be a strange and serious actress, which is absolutely silly because it's all the same business but um that's what you think when you're a child but uh yeah that's how i began right it's um it's ingrained in the blood as they say absolutely coursing through the veins yeah (laughs) so did you do um a lot of school plays in community theater um where you grew up um, I, we did school plays and I sometimes wrote plays that I then directed and even once or twice took to old people's homes and things like that. And I used to, I had what I called my school troupe and in between each class I used to um, rehearse them into commercials. So we used to do the commercial breaks in between, <laughs> act them out and everything in between the classes. So I was kind of doing that stuff from about the age of eight or nine really. Nice, nice. Were you born in England and raised in Ireland? Yes, I was born in London. Um, and then I said, my mother is Irish and my father is partially Irish. And um, so we used to spend all the holidays uh, in Ireland at the family farm. But I was at an Irish convent in Kent in England. Uh, uh, where did uh, your name Drinkwater come from? Well, there are two strands of 
of an entry quarter. I mean, it's it's um, either quite an honourable name, or mm -hmm. a, originally they think it came from somewhere in the middle of England, um, around the Midlands. Um, but there's also the joke that when people drank too much, they used to lock them in the stocks, which was those old things where they locked your hands and feet into wooden frames, and then they used to throw tomatoes at them and shout, drink water. But I, <laughs> I have no idea if, if A, that's true, and B, that's the branch of the family that we come from. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it a common name? No, not really. But funny enough, on the continent here, um, there, in Italy, there is a writer called Beve Lacroix, which is drink water. And there, is, there was, years ago, a French writer called Boileau, um, drink water also. So mm -hmm. it, it's curious that it does exist in, in several languages and has become a name. It's not a very common name, though. I see, I see. It's, it, it's a great name. I like it. It is a good name, yeah. It is a good name. Yeah. Don't forget it. Oh no. You don't forget it. <laughs> no, that's a name you don't forget. <laughs> uh, so after high school, did you did you study acting anywhere? I did. I went to Drama Centre in London, which was one of the big schools. Um, I spent three years um, studying everything: Greek drama, uh, drama throughout the you know the ages, movements, movement psychology, the whole lot was included in the three years that I spent there. It was an excellent training, really excellent training. Writing was involved in it as well, writing drama. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you have any um, uh, classmates that went on to become successful at acting? Uh, there's several people that um, were not necessarily in my class that, that I know that were around the time I was there. Simon Callow, Pierce Brosnan, oh. Geraldine James, um, sorry, uh, um, Colin Firth. Mm -hmm. All sort of around, around, Colin was slightly after, Simon Callow I think was before, I'm not sure. Um, Pierce Brosnan was just after, Geraldine James was at the same time as me. Um, you know, yeah, quite a few. That's amazing. Yeah, I know when I talk to actors and I find out that they were in classes with, you know, people who were big stars, I just, I always love hearing those stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have um, a teacher who was uh, well known? Uh, no, not, I, I didn't, well, we had a teacher called, um, oh, I can't remember my name, who taught at, um, at the method school in New York where, where Brando and Kazan and people like that were, um, Doreen, mm -hmm. Doreen somebody, I can't remember her surname now, but you probably wouldn't know. I mean, I don't think any of the teachers that we worked with, Yat Malmgren was uh, our movement teacher, he was very famous, but I don't think in America, in Europe, he was famous. Mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily, no. Mm -hmm. That must have been just an amazing time because going on, you know, in the States, there was civil rights and the women's lib and the sexual revolution going on. Yes, I wrote about a lot of, of that in, in my novel, The House on the Edge of the Cliff, which was two novels ago of mine, um, about the, you know, the, the students' revolution in Paris in 1968. And of course, I mean, I was at school then. I, I was just going to drama school in 68, I think. Um, but before that, I mean, everything that was going on in Height, Ashbury, uh, that started in San Francisco, and yeah. all that kind of movement, the psychedelic movement, uh, the peace movement, the anti-Vietnam movement, that was all, uh, while I was sort of, it was really enforced while I was still at school, and then just as I went to drama school, it was also, then, in, it, then it was in Paris. So it was a very exciting time in terms of young people feeling that they could change the world, and at that stage as I was a young person, I was 18 or something, um, you know, I kind of felt that I was part of a generation that promised to make a difference. Do you know what I mean? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm born and raised in uh, San Francisco. Did you get to uh, visit while you were in school? Did I get to visit San Francisco? Yeah. I have visited San Francisco, but not when I was at school. Oh, okay. No, no, I visited San Francisco about... Um, Six years ago, I think I was on a book and film tour in America, 
San Fran was one of our stops on the way. I think we did a couple of gigs there at a bookstore and somewhere else, I can't remember now. Um, I was a month in America touring, talking about my books and my film work and stuff. Um, so that was the first time I'd ever been to San Francisco. It was quite amazing to go to High to Ashbury and places like that have been such kind of iconic names for me from the time I was you know, growing up and at drama school. So it was rather wonderful to finally get there. I love San Francisco. It's a great city. Yeah, oh, it's, it used to be a lot better, but it's it, it's changed an awful lot. I can tell you. <laughs> Is it? Oh. Yeah, oh. it's become it's become very strange over there. So, how does a Clockwork Orange come into your life? It was my first job out of drama school. Um, I was uh, the day after I left drama school. I was at my father's um, theatrical agency, just answering the telephone until I got my first job or wherever I was going to go, and uh, an American voice came on the phone and said, I picked up the phone and said it was the Jerusalem agency, and, and um, this woman said, hi, can I speak to Carol Drinkwater, please? And I said, this is me, and this is me speaking. And she said, hi, I'm Stanley Kubrick's assistant. And I thought it was one of the kids at drama school fooling around with me. <laughs> and, and I said, come on. And she said, no, this is Stanley Kubrick's assistant. We'd like to know, would you like to come and screen test for Stanley? Well, I was kind of completely bowled away. You don't expect that the day you leave drama school. Uh, so I went and did a screen test in London, and... Um, uh, when I got the job, it was only a couple of lines in the film. I, mean, it was, I think it was four lines that were cut to two or something in the end. Mm. But, and it kept getting cancelled the day because they were behind on schedule. And I was being paid by the day. So for a young actress um, just beginning, the small amount of money that I was paid on the day, I think I got paid three times in the end because until they finally used me. Um, and then, of course, I got to meet Stanley on the day, which was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, you had a good. Uh, I mean, she kind of, oh, go of course, I had no idea at the time that the film would end up being such an iconic film, such a an yeah. important film. And um, well, of course, Stanley Kubrick was Stanley Kubrick, but even so, you don't necessarily know that the work you're involved in is going to be something that goes down in film history, which this film most certainly has. Mm hmm So you had a very, good. So very you, special. Yeah. yeah. So you, so you had a good experience with Stanley Kubrick. I had an excellent um, experience with Stanley Kubrick. And uh, even beyond the film, I mean, uh, I used to write to him sometimes. He always wrote back. Um, on the same, on the, you know, the same letter. He always replied in the same letter and handwritten. I wish I'd kept those letters. I really do. But there we are. You don't at the time think of that. No, I had an e excellent experience with him. And it, interestingly, um, it's the only time I've ever been on a film set where every member of the crew that I spoke to said, Stanley could do my job even better than I could. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you hear crew members sometimes they moan about something or they're not happy with something or they're fine about it, but I've never heard such unanimous admiration for a director as oh. I heard for Stanley that day when I was working there. Oh, yeah. I I'm... did one day, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, most praised him for you know what a great uh, filmmaker he was. But you know, certain people that he worked with, you know, said that you know he'd keep them on set for like two hundred takes, and it would just you know drain them. <laughs> yes, I've heard those kind of stories, but that wasn't my experience at all. I mean, <clears throat> he 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 was very clear what he wanted from from me, from the scene, from my role within the film, tiny as it was. Mm -hmm. He still. Wanted, he still wanted me to know precisely what the input would be of what I was doing. He also was very willing to listen to anything I had to say, and he did indeed. I said, how about, instead of that, how about this? And he said, that's a terrific idea, let's do that. So, you know, he was extremely flexible about um, what I wanted to do, um, even within his film and such a tiny part. He was very considerate of the fact that, um, as I was topless in the film, that it was a closed set. Mm -hmm. very sensitive to that. Um, I think he knew it was my first job out of drama school, so he was also sensitive to that. I thought he was extraordinary. So, you know, I'm sure that other people have different kind of experiences, but it certainly wasn't my experience. Yeah. Um, were you familiar with his other movies? I'd seen other movies of his before I did that, yes, of course. Yeah, because... He was, he was, 
you know, he was the kind of hero. <laughs> you know, one of those people you grow up, when they have a new film coming out, you want to go and see it, Doctor Strange Love or whatever it was, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey, those kind of, you know, they, those are films that, you know, sort of uh, they're pillars along the, along the path of your experience and film watching, you know? So, of course, I choose his work, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Lolita is my uh, personal favorite from him. Lolita. Yeah. Yes, I saw that too. Of course, yeah. Yeah, because Malcolm McDowell said in an interview, you know, uh, somebody asked him, uh, what, what, uh, what's your favorite Stanley Kubrick movie? And he said, A Clockwork Orange, because that's the only one I've ever seen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's the only one he's ever seen? Gosh, that's a, well, that surprises me. Maybe he was joking. Well, he, well, at the t- no, at the time he was serious, but I heard him do an interview about a year ago where he said he actually just saw two thousand and one: A Space Odyssey, and he was just impressed of how you know that was the the, the film that he did before Clockwork Orange. So he couldn't yeah. believe how he went from doing a film that was so abstract to doing something like a Clockwork Orange. He was actually impressed by that. He said. But I think that's true of Stanley's work throughout. I mean, he never repeated himself. And no. one of the things that make him such a great director and such a great artist is that I, everything he did, as far as I'm concerned, um, was, was a, a new innovation. I mean, he, he, he wasn't, you know, like some people write the same book all the time or just keep churning up the same kind of material. That was never the case with him. I mean, Barry Lyndon is not like anything else he did, is it? No, that's a very underrated movie. It's what? It's a very underrated movie. It is a very... I watched it... Myself and my husband watched it about um, six months ago, I think, and I, and I remember saying to Michelle then, you know, this film is, is really not appreciated for... I mean, it's a wonderful film. Mm-hmm. Really wonderful film. In fact, I enjoyed it more this time than I did the first time I saw it, and maybe... We, ha- we all had different expectations for Stanley. I think it's an absolutely terrific film. Yeah, it's, it's very terrific. Um, did you spend any time with Malcolm McDowell? No, he wasn't well. And um, he'd been... Well, that's that's why they got to be about a month or a month behind schedule, I think, because he hadn't been well. So, no, I didn't spend any time with him at all. I, I mean, apart from speaking to him on the set, I don't think I even met him off the set at all. I have no memory of it anyway. Mm -hmm. He's a very fascinating actor. He's very... I don't know his work all that well. I mean, he works in America and has done for years. Right. Uh, And as he doesn't seem to do a lot of big movies or movies that get to Europe, I don't really know his work that well anymore. Yeah, he's done a lot of like... Do you lots of television now? He does television. He does a lot of independent films. Um, I don't know. Certain actors, you know, they, they, they develop a reputation for being intense, and then they can't get cast in, like, big studio films anymore, so then they get cast in independent films because, you know, the independent film directors, you know, have a respect for their talent. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I think that's a more interesting path to be taking. Absolutely, Yeah. So yeah, the I think what what's so wonderful about a Clockwork Orange is that, you know, it's this wonderful commentary on capitalist societies within government, you know, experiments, and right. the and the way that these reformed programs are are supposed are meant to supposed to work, but yet they just make everything worse. I mean, that's more true and relevant right. today. I feel. I think it's a it's a it's a visionary film. It's way ahead of its time. Did you? I don't know if you know this, but um, Stanley had it banned after it first came out. It didn't show in England until yeah. after his death. He had it removed. He didn't want it to be seen because he said that he felt that the violence was being misunderstood. Right. Did, did, um, didn't it get an X rating? Uh, I think it did get an X rating, but, yeah. I, I, but it, it was Stanley's choice that it was taken out of circulation. It continued to be shown in Paris because I, I, I live in France and I've lived over here for a long time. And I remember when I first came over here, there, there was one little cinema in, in Paris mm-hmm. that showed it all the time. 
I mean, it was, it was like uh, available uh, screening maybe just once a week or once a fortnight within their program for something like 20 years. They, they continued mm. to keep it in circulation. And I don't know if that's some kind of gesture because Sir Stanley had taken it out of circulation in England. I think it was just, it was just out of, in England, I think it was, I think he got some reviews or I don't know what, but I know it was something to do, he felt that the violence had been misunderstood. Yeah, I mean, it was a long time before I had even heard of the movie. Um, I, 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 mean, I, I, yeah, because it, it wasn't until like maybe the the late nineties, and then I found out that they made fun of that movie all the time on The Simpsons, and so that's that was like my 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 early reference uh, for it. And I didn't even know what they were doing. Uh, they did a Simpsons Halloween special where Bart is dressed as Malcolm McDowell in a Clockwork Orange. I didn't even know. Really? What, I, yeah, I didn't even know what huh. what that was a reference to at the time. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, look. It, it it may have, but I was probably just way too young to watch it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, by the late 90s, I started seeing it on video shelves and stuff, and then that's how I uh, first discovered it. Right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Extraordinary, isn't it? Well, maybe, maybe that was some kind of knock-on from, you know, his reaction to it in England. I, I, I really don't know. I, didn't, I never spoke to him about it, but um, um, no, I really don't know. But it is a, it's a phenomenal, a very visionary film. And certainly now, I mean, you look at things that are going on in the world and you think, oh, that film was so way ahead of its time. Mm hmm It sure was. And some people don't even know if it's a sci-fi film or a horror film or both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's both, isn't it, really, in a way. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's yeah. kind of reality, too, you know? Yeah. I wouldn't call it a sci-fi film, actually. I wouldn't call it a sci-fi film. Have you read the Anthony Burgess novel, which it's based on? No, no, I haven't. Have you? No, I haven't. I haven't. And, and I just now I'm just sitting here thinking I should read that. Yeah. Um, because I'm a big reader. I don't know why I've ever missed it, but there we are. You know, maybe because it came into my life so early, and then I moved on, that I just never thought about it. But I should, I should get hold of it, and and I know that Anthony Burgess was extremely pleased with the film. I do know that. I heard that from quite a few people in the publishing world that he was very impressed with what um, Kubrick did to his work. Yeah. Oh, so that's good. Yeah, because Stephen King wasn't uh, happy with uh, Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining. He he actually remade it like on TV years later. Yeah, and I, I know a lot of people who don't like that version of The Shining. But you know, you know, to each their own. Everybody's got their own taste. Indeed. Yeah. 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 Were you, I like The Shining. I think it's a good film. Yeah. I think it's a very good film. But yes. I, think, I can see. You know. I mean. If, Stephen King has every right to to have imagine it in a different way, of course. Of course, yeah. Um, it, I mean, there are a lot of differences from the book, from what I've been told, but it's still a really good movie, and it just it, it was a yes. very intense filming, from what I've been told. Yes, I heard that too. So, so did you get uh, did you get nervous at all uh, for being topless? I didn't know that I had to be told. It's extraordinary because, I mean, now you wouldn't get away with this, but I got on the set. Yeah. And first of all, that was one of the things that Stanley, Stanley said, you know, you've just, as a nurse, you've just been making love with the doctor and now you've got to come and look after Malcolm. And, you know, you're called and you're undressed. And he actually wants me not to have anything on at all. I mean, not my costume on at all. Yeah. And I didn't want, I mean, I was very surprised. I hadn't been expecting that. Um, and I said, well, can't I have some of my costume on? He said, well, you know. So I said, well, why don't I keep my stiff um, uh, collar and, and uh, cuff, you know, the cuffs, and the top I, is pulled off, like, you know, the doctor just pulled it off. He said, that's a great idea. Let's go with that. That was the thing that I suggested. You know, I said just now that I suggested something, and he said, let's go with it. So I hadn't expected that. I mean, they had said to me after the screen test when they offered the role, there might be some um, some partial nudity, I think they said. But I think I was so excited at the thought of working with Stanley, I don't think I really took it in. I mean, today, uh, everything is so much more controlled that right. um, it would have been in the contract or something, I think. 
I don't even remember there being a contract. There must have been, though. You know, a little little something or other. Um, one page or something. I mean, today you'd have a 75-page contract about this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, so I was very surprised. I wasn't expecting. And, and so when I not negotiated with him, but when I actually said, you know, how about, wouldn't it be more interesting if it looked like you just ripped my top off? And he just said, yeah, that's a great idea. And I actually kept the, the nurse's stiff collar oh. and, and the cuffs, which, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I kept my cap as well. I can't remember. <laughs> well, you looked beautiful, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, you still look good. I saw um, a Zoom podcast you did recently. You still look good. Thank you. Of course. Um, in 1976, you did Queen Kong, and I never even knew Queen Kong existed. <laughs> I think that film, was, that film never made circulation, as oh, yeah? far as I know. I think it was it was because they were making uh, Dino De Laurentiis was making a remake of uh, King Kong at the time. I think he had it snapped out of circulation. Right. I don't think he's ever saw the cinemas. Yeah. So it's a cult movie because it's hard to get hold of, and um, it's a collector's item. I think. Mhm. Mm yeah. I, I... I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Yeah, I've seen the, the 1976 Dino, Laurent, uh, Dino De Laurentiis um, version, of course. Um, but yeah, uh, hope maybe there's a uh, there's a copy of this one I can get on eBay or something. What of Queen Kong? Of Queen Kong, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, it's it's okay. It's not easy to get hold of. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think who was in it when I was. Oh, Rilla Lenska was in it. I, I played her agent in it, I think. Um, and was Robin Asquith in it as well? Mm hmm. Yeah. I think so, yeah. I don't know where to get hold of some copies. I could ask him. Mm hmm. That's cool. I'll ask Robin. Mm hmm. If you're interested in having a copy. I mean, I don't know if he's got any, but I can ask him. Okay, yeah. Uh, we'll talk in email about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, in 1978, you played the cobbler's wife in The Shout. Uh, how how was that experience? How was that? What the experience? Yeah, how was that experience uh, on that set? I had a wonderful time on that. I absolutely loved doing that film. Um, Yerge Skolomowski is a very interesting director. Very interesting director. Yeah. And I was working with John Hurt and Alan Bates and Susanna York. Um, and my bits were mainly with uh, John Hurt, um, I think. Uh, I loved it. I had a wonderful time. Yeah, great fun. A, a Jersey School Lebowski, he's also a good actor. I saw him play a bad guy. In yeah, a, he is. I saw him play a bad guy in a comedy movie once, and I was like, wow, he's got pretty good range uh, in addition to being a good filmmaker. He's a good filmmaker. He's also a writer. Um, right. I was in Poland a while ago. I can't remember... Uh, when precisely promoting my my books, I, 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 the whole range of them had just been translated into Polish, and they flew me over. And I saw that he had been at the same big bookstore the night before. And I said to the publicist, "Is there anywhere contacting him? I'd absolutely love to see him again." Um, and she didn't have any contact for him, and he was promoting his book. So I, would, I was so sad that we missed each other by a day because I had a wow, a really wonderful time working with him. I thought he was su such a talented, creative human being and full of, full of very, um, very immediate inspiration. You know, you just would take yeah. something and run with it. And I just, he was quite brilliant, I think. I loved him. I, it's a good film, too. Have you seen it? I saw, I saw it years oh. ago, yeah. It's a, it's a good movie. Uh, did you work with Susanna York? I didn't have any scenes with her, but I spent... Uh, no, I don't think I had any scenes with her. But I spent quite a lot of time with her. I mean, we were in Devon, all of us together for... It seemed like a whole summer, but it was, it was a very beautiful, very hot summer. And so being in Devon was kind of a really wonderful place to be. And we spent a lot of time together, all of us. Lots of kind of fun time and evenings together. And um, Yeah, I liked, I liked her. She's a very fragile lady. Mm hmm Rather nervous, fragile lady. I thought I remember her as being. Oh. 
Tim, uh, Tim Curry, so brilliant. Sorry? Tim Curry, he he was in the movie, He was he's brilliant. Oh, Tim Curry, I guess I was, I was in rep with Tim Curry years before that, in theater with Tim Curry, so I used to know him quite well, yeah. Yeah, w- did, did, he's still around. <laughs> and is he still around doing stuff? He uh, he had a he had a stroke a few years ago. I heard, um, uh, but um, he, yeah, I mean he's still around. I don't know if he he works as much anymore because of the stroke he had. Uh, but I think he's in a wheelchair. Oh. oh no, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, he was great fun. I loved him. He was really yeah. Uh, he was great. He was great to work with. <laughs> Yeah, even even in, um, in in acting school, you know, before he was Frank, he was Frankenfooter and uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, yes, he was in Rocky Horror. I was at the Glasgow Citizens Theatre with him. Um, we were up there in in rap, and that was great fun. Yeah! Wow. Um, all all creatures, great and small. Is that is that what you're known for the most in Europe? Uh, yes, I think it probably is, yes. Yeah, I mean, that that show had a pretty good run, didn't it? It's still running all over the place. Yeah. It's still, they're rerunning it in England now. Um, PBS was showing it before Christmas because there's been a remake of it. Mm-hmm. And um, before the remake, I think PBS put out some of the earlier, the classic stuff. Um, and it's playing in Finland at the moment, in Germany. I mean, it's constantly playing. I, I know because I get mail all the time for it, you know, about it. Yeah, I do remember it uh, being shown on PBS years ago. Yeah, it, the PBS were part of the original um, co-producers on it, so mm-hmm. I think they've always had some rights to it. And then, as I say, it was repeated before Christmas last year um, during, you know, during lockdown and everything. And I got lots of mail from America saying they'll be showing it. And I said, oh, I think it must be because there's a new one coming out. Oh, that's wonderful. I showing it, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. Was that Was that a good time making that show? Yes, it was, uh, yes, I mean, it was a long-term thing. I did uh, about 42 episodes of then two TV films. So I was on it on and off for about um, six years or something, maybe a bit longer. Yeah, about six years. So it, it's a, a kind of chunk of my life. And it's certainly in terms of television, it certainly whacked my status right up there, you know. I mean, right. I got invited to work all over the place for that job. Um, and it gave me kind of... You know that kind of television credibility, which actors sort of long for. You know, so um, right. it certainly changed my life from that point of view. Right. I I, lo- I love how actors are always willing to work in, in all platforms in England, you know, whether it's television, theater, movies. Um, I, I, I just love the work ethic that, that, that uh, English actors have. I think part of the reason is that there is, the movie business is so much smaller than it is in America. Yeah. And um, drama on television is also, um, you know, there's far less of it. Um, I mean, now there's Netflix and stuff like that, so I mean, lots of the, the more recent English actors have the opportunity to move over and work there if they get the job. And, you know, so that, that's a new opportunity for streaming platforms. But I think in England, the point is that there's not enough of any one medium for uh, people to say, I'm only going to do that, unless they reach a certain stage and then they go to America and do lots of work over there. Mm-hmm, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, people like Daniel Day-Lewis, who went and then he did the films that he did, he did them in America, and then he just retired to Ireland. Colin Firth does most of his films outside England. Oh, so yeah. Only one of very few uh, is an English picture, because there simply isn't enough material to sustain their careers. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So what made you turn to writing? Um, well, it was, I've been writing since I was about eight. I mean, as I said, I was writing plays when I was at school, and then I was writing diaries and then journals when I was traveling. So I've always been writing. Um, but there came a stage where I just, um, I met my husband, uh, the man who became my husband, um, and he said, you know, is there any dream? And I told him that I wanted to write. So he said, okay, look, I'll help, I'll help encourage you through that. Um, and so when I decided it was time for me to leave all creatures, because I felt I'd given the role everything that was to give to it, um, I decided to start to try and write. And I wrote a children's um, 
book called The Haunted School, which my husband, Michelle, uh, produced, and we made that in Australia. I played the main role in it. And um, it was bought by Disney, and it won the Chicago Film Festival Gold Award for children's films. And so that began, that, so it got off to a very good start, and it sold very well for in those days, children's books didn't sell as well. I mean, since Harry Potter, of course, all that's changed. But before yeah. that, children's books didn't sell enormously. So it did do very well, and it got me off to... Uh, to uh, I got a writing contract from Penguin, and um, things started to roll from there. So I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can make this dream work. I didn't intend to give up acting, but as I'd moved to France, um, and I was writing, and I was less available for acting, it just seemed to be the way things turned out, that I... It's more writing than acting. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, is it harder to, to write a novel than a children's book? Um, well, a, a novel is longer. <laughs> so it, it probably takes longer. Um, well, it depends, of course, the Harry Potter books are 600 pages or something, so they're longer than my novels. But um, I think, I don't think it's, one is harder than the other. I mean, I, I think writing for children or young people you know, they're very, very um, aware. Uh, I don't think you can fool young people, either on the stage or in... Uh, they have a very acute sense of truth. And so I don't think that one it, one is necessarily easier than the other. I think that they're just... It's a, you just put on a slightly different uh, hat, a different perspective to the world. You look at it from another eye rather than it being easier or not easier looking at it from a young person's point of view rather than a grown-up person or grown-up an adult's point of view. Yeah, I'm writing two books. I'm, write, I'm writing two books right now. They're pretty easy, but they're very tedious. The whole process of writing one's part memoir and part movie guide, and then the other one's a trivia book. Right. Well, they're very different kinds of books, aren't they? That's very different to. A trivia book, I wouldn't know where to begin with something like that. That's, I mean, that's about gathering information, really, more than anything else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you have a hobby or something that you're good at, that you have knowledge about, you can write one, you know. Yeah, but you have to have a, an immense amount of knowledge about that one subject. Right. You know? and, and you got the assistance of the Internet. And I don't think... Uh, it would. It I. I can't imagine writing a trivia book before the internet would would would, would have been like. <laughs> I really can't. Well, you'd have to go to libraries. You'd be in libraries all the time. Oh yes, you'd be in libraries all the time. It it would be it would be even more t tedious. But I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah. So your your newest book is an act of love. Mm -hmm. where, where did the inspiration behind that book come from? Um, well, it's, based, it's, it's inspired by a true story. It's set during World War II. It's the story, it's set down here in the south of France, behind Nice, up in the, the lower Alps, where there, there are lots of small villages. And of course, in, during the Second World War, they were much more cut off. This area of France was known as the Free Zone. It was the area where the Nazis were not in control. They had the north, all of the north of France, and part of the southwest. But this area they didn't have. So it became known that it was an area where the Jews were safe. Jews or, or refugees or anyone who was fleeing the possibility of being taken by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, there was the possibility of coming here and being safe. And then at the end of 1942, when the Allies took North Africa, won North Africa, um, Hitler was determined then to come into the free zone because he feared, quite rightly, because this is what happened, that the Allies would come up to Italy and take the Mediterranean, that take the, come into France through the shores of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. As soon as that decision was made and the Nazis decided to move into the free zone, all the refugees, the Jews, that were hiding here were no longer safe. Most of them were along the coast, uh, along the Riviera coast or up to Marseille, um, which is where I've been today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly they weren't safe. One of the first places the Nazis made for was Marseille, and they, they raised the whole, they cut, burnt down a whole... Mm -hmm. part of Marseille, the old quarter of Marseille. I've been reading about it today. Um, and they, they um, 
arrested, I think, something like two or 3,000 Jews and put them on trains to Drancy and then to Auschwitz. So once this happened, that was at the very beginning of 1943, it became very clear that all along this coast, right up to Italy, the refugees or those in hiding were in serious danger. And there were several villages inland, one in particular, which is where my story is set, that said, we will take in, we will hide the refugees. And so my story is set in 1943 in a village where the perhaps 600 French inhabitants, but just farmers, sheep, you know, sheep um, looking after the she shepherds or growing their own vegetables or whatever it is, very simple, ordinary agricultural people. And they took in about 800 refugees, almost all of them Jews from Eastern Europe, Russia, all around that part of, of Europe mainly. All of them, once they were bussed up there mm -hmm. for a period of two or three months, where they could speak their own languages, they could speak Yiddish to each other, they made friends with some of the locals, they were free to move around because there was no one threatening them. Mm -hmm. And for between November 1942 and September 1943, when the Nazis came, it was almost a kind of paradisical time for them. They were not hunted, they were free to be who they were, Nobody resented them for being Jewish. Mm -hmm. and my, my story is of a 17-year-old girl who ends up in this village with her parents, and they're given a house outside town, which has been vacated by an English couple. You don't know why at the beginning of the story. And it's this girl, it's a coming-of-age story, and it's a war story, and it's a young woman who goes on to work for the resistance. It's, it's many levels of a love story, and which is why it's... And she falls in love with a local boy who is a medical student, and we find out that he's working for the resistance. So it, and it's an act of love on many levels. But the, the, the people who took them in, these villagers, and that really happened, risked their own lives because to hide a, um, a Jew meant it was a death sentence. So wow. they were very courageous, these, these villagers. So it's a story that's, that's based on, inspired by this true story, and it's been receiving amazing reviews. So um, I'd like to see it made into a film. I sort of wrote, wrote it with a film in mind, you know. I'd, yeah. I'd see it filming, so I'd love to see it made into a film. Oh, that's wonderful. What, what, was it influenced by the diary of Anne Frank? Yeah, not in the least. Not in the least. I've read the diary of Anne Frank, and I've actually been to Holland, and I've been visited the house where she and her family were hidden. Um, but it's not based on their story anywhere at all, no. I mean, obviously, she was also Jewish, and they were hiding, so that's in common. But um, it's very much my own story, and very much of based on the experiences of, of um, refugees here in France during the Second World War. Because um, here they were able to be in the open, they weren't hiding, uh, it sealed up in an area of a house where no one knew where they were. They were actually in a village, uh, and there was a village everywhere else in France didn't know what was going on. Within the village they were free, they, went, they would dance with the Italian soldiers, they would, you know, get to know the local people, they became friends with the local, other local people, go swimming with them. You know, it was a very free and open experience for a very short time between the beginning of 1943 and September the 8th, 1943, when they had to fly, uh, flee the village, and it's what happened then, and to my girl Sarah and her family, and what goes on, you know, what happens after that as well. Oh, I so I think it's a very moving story, um, and as I say, it's inspired by a true situation. It sounds like it. i got to check it out. Is it, is it available in audio yet? Yes, it is. I recorded it myself. Nice, nice. I'm going to check that out. Uh, do you have any plans for uh, um, another book? I'm just, I'm just researching a new book at the moment, and I'm actually starting work on a television series next week, which is something quite different for me. Oh, I'm yeah. going in front of the camera. Um, uh, uh, so I'm not really supposed to talk about it yet, but yeah. it's... Um, not as a presenter, but to introduce this part of the world to an English... It's a six-part series introducing my experience of this part of the world, uh, talking about the village where I discovered about, uh, you know, where these refugees were in an act of love, 
about going to Marseille for uh, the House on the Edge of the Cliff. So my, where my novels have inspired me down here and also introducing the audience to the places that I've grown to know and love down here um, in all the years I've been living in the South of France. So it's, it's an exciting and very different. Um, it's half actress, half writer, really. I'm wearing several hats at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, in front of the camera for it. So it's um, scary and exciting. Yeah, it sounds like it's, it sounds wonderful, Carol. Um, yeah, you mentioned in the uh, email about the, the series that you had started working on. That's great. I'm, yeah. I'm very happy for you in this in this crazy time. Everybody's you know starting to get back to work a little bit, and hopefully, oh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully you know uh, the, the world you know will be back to normal soon. But at least you 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 got that that going on, and I thank you for uh, coming on today. A real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. For thinking of me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, and I'm glad that uh, we we were able to uh, uh, connect this way and not on Facebook Messenger because <laughs> we'd probably have a lot I of. Think this is yeah. I, I do, yeah. I think we'd have a lot of technical issues if we had done um, on uh, on Facebook Messenger. Uh, it, it's happened occasionally, but yes. Yeah, so stay safe, and I will um, check out uh, your book and um, uh, have a good time on the series. And <laughs> you know, maybe we can talk again in the future about it. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Ali. Wonderful. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Well, there you have it. Carol Drinkwater. Ain't she a sweetheart? What a very nice lady, huh? And I'm glad um, we could uh, connect today and talk about Clockwork Orange and the rest of her career. Check out her book, An Act of Love, available on Amazon and on her website. I should have asked her first, but I'm sure it is. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!